12 years than originally predicted. Kostya rode the train from Omsk to Moscow. Only now his destination was not the Olympic Village, but a travel agent's. Partly because the Peruvians did not demand a visa, Kostya bought a plane ticket to Lima. Most of his money spent, he turned the remainder over to an old woman who claimed to be Emil's aunt. Emil is his trainer. She provided him with a pillow and a wool blanket and helped him push a coffee table against the living room wall. Costa stayed with her for three nights until his flight departed for Peru. On the plane, he sat quietly, hoping in this way not to attract attention to himself. Most of the other passengers on the plane were Russians, and Costa wondered how many of them had the same intentions he did. It seemed strange to him that so many Russians would want to go to Peru. To him, almost all of them looked suspicious. He assumed that he looked suspicious as well and feared that one of the passengers or the stewardesses would denounce him to the pilot or some other authority. But when the plane set down for refueling in Gander, Newfoundland, Kostya was invited to exit along with everyone else. To his surprise, everything happened just as Emil had written. He followed the line of passengers down a long hallway and found himself inside the terminal. To prepare himself, he chose a chair in the remotest part of the concourse and went through the contents of a shoulder bag. At the very bottom, he found his sneakers. Doing his best to casually conceal what he was doing, he peeled the insole off his right shoe and palmed the scrap of paper he had hidden there. Then he repackaged, then he repacked his bag and walked the floor of the terminal until he saw what he was looking for. Standing near a newsstand was a woman in a uniform. Costa did not know what the uniform signified, but it looked official. Willing himself forward, as though for an irreversible leap into cold water, Costa approached the woman and read from the scrap of paper in his hand. Ya yem, a refugee, Costa said. Subverting his every reasonable expectation, the woman responded in heavily accented Russian. You want refugee status? Yes, Costa said. Follow me, she instructed. Kostya spent two weeks in the refugee shelter in Gander before he was claimed by Father Nikita, a Russian Orthodox priest who operated a halfway house for immigrants in Toronto. When he arrived at the house, Emil was there to greet him, talking immediately about his plans. That same night, Kostya moved into Emil's one-bedroom apartment in the north end of the city. The apartment was in a building occupied mainly by Russians flanked by other buildings, occupied by other Russians. Many of these Russians were also Jews, but Kostya couldn't particularly tell the difference. On the main street, there were Russian delicatessens, Russian bookshops, Russian video stores, and even signs and posters in Russian tacked onto the bus shelters and telephone poles. At the nearby park and at the playground, Kostya heard as much Russian as English. If he needed to go to the supermarket, there was always someone around to translate the labels. For Kostya, the non-Russian world existed only in the various gyms where Emil took him for their workouts. But even there, few demands were made on Kostya to communicate in any but the crudest ways. He learned the English vocabulary of boxing. Jab, cross, hook, slip, uppercut. Also useful was the word okay. Not long after Costa settled in, Emil drove him to meet their benefactor. They made the short trip over in Emil's minivan, a van he had been using for years to deliver pizza. Don't talk unless you have to, Emil said. And no matter what I say, don't contradict me. The man they were to meet was Bonka Goldfarb. Before the collapse of the Soviet Union, Bonka had sold real estate in Toronto. But after the collapse, he had returned to his native Kiev and made a fortune dealing in manganese. He was one of the richest Russian immigrants in Toronto. Rarely did he return home, spending most of his time in Kiev, overseeing his concerns. But occasionally, to appease his wife and children, he came back. Because of this, getting an audience with him was extremely difficult. Nevertheless, he had set aside half an hour for them. 
Bonka designated the meeting not at his offices, but at a new Russian restaurant in which he held a partial interest. The restaurant was minutes away from Emil's apartment, situated in a strip mall. Since he did not have the money for indulgences, Emil had not been there before, but he'd heard about it. It was reputed to be the largest and most glamorous of all the Russian restaurants. It featured, Emil had heard, a massive fountain in the foyer. The fountain, Bonka Goldfarb explained when he greeted them, was a reproduction of one he had seen in Rome. When he'd invested in the restaurant, it had been on the condition that it include such a fountain. The fountain was a marble sculpture. It reached almost to the ceiling and consisted of four fish supporting the torso of a powerfully built man.